I have a, a leg that doesn't always do what I want it to do. Well, I, uh, I wound up showing my daughter uh, a lot of pictures and a lot of notes and put it together and she said, way too much, Dad. And uh, we cut some down and we came down and talked with Mike last Wednesday morning. He said, way too much, Marv. So, and, but I'm gonna have to talk fast because there's still some real good stuff. Um, I, uh, I grew up in Norfolk, Nebraska and, uh, and uh, went to high school there and uh, the background, the class of 1943, I was a freshman. Those guys suddenly were all gone. All those guys I'd watched play ball and knew their families, brothers and sisters, and uh, class of 44 uh, graduated. And it was about, they graduated about a week before D-Day. Or, yeah, and uh, so, the, the friends were gone, my teammates were gone. Class of 45, I graduated about uh, 10 days after uh, the, the Germans surrendered. We, we still assumed that, uh, that a year from then, when we graduated in 1946, that we'd be going to the surface and go invade Japan. We had absolutely no idea what was going on down in New Mexico. But about two, two months later, uh, August 6th, uh, we found out. And everything, plans started to change. Well, a year later, after we got up, after we graduated, uh, started a little, there was a little junior college back in Norfolk, about 160, 70, mainly females, all during that war. The guys that were there in the freshman became 18 and disappeared before the end of that first school year. So, um, joined, went to junior college there uh, for a year and a half. My coach back there thought I ought to come to his school at Green, which I did. And uh, during that period of time, as few of you may remember, there were vets villages growing up all over uh, every university and college campus in the country. Uh, 75 bucks a month and your tuition, books, and fees at the college. Uh, I think married guys got 125 if they had a kid or two, and uh, they were making it through the best village. They wanted to come back. Guys 25, 26 years old said, I'm going to get a college education. And they used that GI Bill, the best legislation anybody ever passed any time. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I graduated. I taught uh, what two-thirds of a school year at Adam City High School. I had 150 kids there. No North Lynn, North Thornton. Uh, uh, Westminster was the next high school over. They had about 200 kids down to 72nd and uh, right down the road there. Yeah. Sure. Not, not that far west, okay. Um, so that summer 1950, I was back in Nebraska trying to rekindle an old uh, romance. Didn't work. But I, I, I signed a, I, I signed a, a contract back there to teach and coach, and I was playing summer pro baseball and driving a wholesale meat truck back there. And the 25th of June, 1950, the North Koreans came across, and uh, oh, I, I forgot. To, people don't believe you. You won't believe that. You don't believe that's me. Okay, or that is I. There, <laughs> freshman, nice. freshman in college. Somebody said you ought to. That, that's how you looked. I did not always wear a tux. Uh, there was a music program, and we had to do it up a bit. So that's what that's coming from. So, what uh, what happened? Who are these guys? North Korea, the uh, the uh, UN, the U.S. intelligence people figure that. The Russians might try something, they're going to test us, but they thought it would be in, uh, in, in, Eastern, uh, in Eastern Europe. They thought something would, uh, the Russians would probably test here if they were going to test the UN and the US. But what? Korea, where is that? Nobody knew. Almost nobody knew. L little peninsula there. And so. Uh, People began to uh, 
find out what was happening there, and uh, people were surprised. Harry Truman took action that surprised almost everyone. He said, this is not going to happen. We're going to take some action here. We're going to get troops involved. And uh, the... Uh, This, this was Korea, and it's called the land of the early morning calm. And if you didn't hear artillery in the background or hear, have a big uh, convoy of tanks going by your place, it was beautiful in the morning. And this was one of the mornings I took, took a couple of pictures, and this is our part of our ambulance company that I'll talk more about later on. So, the, uh, let me back up just a bit. The uh, uh, Sigmund Rhee was saying, we don't, have any, we don't have any weapons. You guys won't send us weapons from the state. One of the uh, military advisors said, if we send those people our latest weaponry in quantity and the North Koreans do something, It'll just become an arsenal for the Chinese, and we're not going to send them our best stuff. And they, they didn't. They were under under trained, under equipped. So it, it was uh, it, one of the British uh, officers said, "If they come through, it, it'll be devastating. They'll just roll right over the top." The commander of the of the American commander said, "Our ground troops will do an excellent job." So the and they were getting those kinds of reports back back in Washington. The uh, so that that's the way the, the As the, uh, Chinese, as the North Koreans came across the border, 38th parallel, um, they, uh, they rolled right over the top. And from uh, June, um, June 25th to uh, just about, about, a, mile, about a, a month and a half, they rolled right down to this Pusan Peninsula. And they rolled up the, Korean, Korean, uh, the South Korean troops backing up. And uh, the, the American troops that were there and the troops that were trying to get from Japan who were uh, uh, not combat ready. The, uh, they were occupation troops, pretty good duty for a lot of them. But they had not been training hard, which it's kind of surprised some people knowing with Arthur. But uh, these, uh, these fellows were moved into, into this Busan first up here and then they pushed back and those who were in shape enough to move and retreat with with the fighting wind up down here 45 miles by 40 miles and uh, there were people on site there and others said they will never be able to hold that they're going to they're going to have to evacuate that whole Pusan uh, peninsula and a general walker said no we're going to stay here and fight and they did and in the meantime, the, uh, uh, the reserves, we call it the reserve officers and uh, uh, non-coms were, be, were being called up back in the States. And, uh, and uh, as some of you know, the, uh, they, they said that MacArthur uh, had this plan and he, he got together enough troops that, they came around and landed up here. And when on the whoop, <laughs> no, go back. Uh, no, way back. Way back. Okay. On the fifth, on the fifteenth of uh, September, uh, troops landed. Uh, here, Dad, let me help you. Yeah. Why don't you let me do it? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this one. 
When the troops landed at, at Incheon, uh, they said they could never land there because the, uh, the uh, tide was so, so much higher there that you could not land. Well, they did land troops uh, walking a long distance of mud flats, uh, fl mad, mud flats to uh, get up. To, so they began moving into towards Seoul, which was about 20 miles away, and they fought. But when the, when the North Korean troops found out down here at Busan that they were possibly going to be cut off, they started moving back. And General, General Walker, with reinforcements that had arrived that were in decent shape, started chasing them. And they, that's the very quick retreat that commenced and kept going all the, all the way eventually up to the Yalu. <clears throat> Uh, meanwhile, back in the States, we'll talk, talk, <laughs> talk about him. Okay. Um, Who's that guy on the left there? <laughs> okay, okay. I, I got drafted. I, I volunteered with the draft in September. We went to Fort Riley, Kansas, and took basic training. And uh, then uh, seven of us went to the guided missile school down at Fort Bliss, Texas. And uh, that was pretty good duty. Uh, nice and warm in the winter time, and uh, that young lady sitting there it was a, a flight attendant for Braniff uh, between San Antonio and uh, El Paso, and we we met. We had a few dates, and then I went to OC, went to OCS at uh, Fort Riley. Uh, OCS about 26, 26 weeks of uh, uh, getting chewed out, seeing if you could take it as an officer if you're going to have to later on. Uh, supervised troops uh, very directly. So uh, at the end of OCS, I had a choice going into uh, armored uh, vision or uh, going with the, the uh, medics. And I, could still, I came in with this captain, he had the armed, uh, he was an armored officer in World War II. And he said, Eeks, do you mean you'd rather go into the blankety blankety blank medics than the combat branches? Yes, sir. And he scrawled a signature on there, pushed the papers back, and I was off to Fort, uh, Fort Sam, uh, Sam Houston, Texas, Brook Army Medical Center, where they, uh, they, everybody coming in who didn't know anything about the medical service, and a few were getting re, uh, reintroduced to that, were uh, six weeks medical basic. And uh, some of us had been in service a long time. There was a, a light colonel there, but probably into his 40s, it was light colonel, and he was going through it. He had been a, an officer in World War II, a non-com for several years, and got his uh, rank back. And on the other hand, there were people who'd never been a, a day in the service. I remember going out the first morning, and there was a fellow there. He was a dentist. He had, he had his uniform on, but he didn't have any of his insignia. So we showed him how to see. And I understand that there was a, a fellow there, not, not in that class, but another time he was introduced, and he was a captain when he went in, and uh, he thought he put those silver bars this way instead of this way. And somebody came along and helped him. I, I, that captain is going to be nameless. The, uh, the medical service, if you're in the medical corps, you were an MD. We were in the medical service corps. There were pharmacists. Phys ed majors, biz ed majors. We did a lot of the administrative stuff, and obviously the pharmacy, uh, the pharmacy uh, guys well, uh, took care of the medical, uh, medical supplies. And uh, so, we spent six weeks there, uh, and I was surprised. I, there were some brand new college graduates, 22 year old uh, women in class, phys ed majors, nutrition majors, and nurses, who were just finding out about medical service. The, the phys ed gals were going to go into a, re, become rehab specialists. They were going to get some excellent training before they went to work in the, the hospitals. And, uh, and uh, the nutrition is obviously into food service. So following, uh, following that, uh, uh, the OCS and the uh, medical officers basic, um, went to uh, 47th Division, Fort Rucker, Alabama, uh, Alabama. And uh, it was the Minnesota National Guard, uh, and uh, they 
they had called him up. There were a bunch of, uh, of uh, vets in, her, in the National Guard, and they brought their families and settled in around Dothan, Alabama, Fort Rucker, and uh, we. Uh, I've really learned about how you were supposed to, uh, how the medical service. Uh, was working because we did exercise there. We went to Texas, Fort Hood, and played war for four weeks. There were about three divisions. That's about 15,000 guys in a division. We, three of us, were the good guys, and one of the, air, I think it was 82nd Airborne, were the nasty guys. They played uh, the, uh, and uh, two things, very quickly, two things that happened there. Um, when we got there, one of the ranchers said, we haven't had any rain in three years, and he just picked up her. And he said, they're going to pay me for using part of my land for you guys playing war out here. And uh, we had exercise during the night. We had to move our chair down, black and night, put our tents, pack them up, and move to a new location, reading maps in the dark, and finding this new location in the dark. Um, we did that twice. Both times just rained like the devil. And we were, we were taking down wet tents and packing them up and then finding this in the dark for some place to set them up and putting up wet. Both times we had to do that night drill. Um, the other thing that happened there, um, they said, okay, we're going we're going to have uh, about 100 paratroopers do a jump and we're going to have simulated injuries. So we're going to have a couple of choppers there and you guys have your ambulances there ready to go. and. Uh, the, the MDs will be there and the, the uh, surgical techs to do triage and say, okay, these guys need to get quickly, get them on the chopper and get them over to what, the station hospital, whatever it was serving as uh, the battalion or the uh, MASH at that time. And you guys, they'll tell you which ones uh, need to go someplace in your ambulance in a hurry and which ones are just not, not mobile. Enough. So we went out in the morning, we are all set up, and the, the, pel the paratroopers, about 100 of them jumped. And the wind was over 20 miles an hour. They should have called it off. We didn't have to simulate. There were 36 injuries, most of them broken bones. And the MDs were doing a real triage. No, and some of these guys were pretty badly hurt, and they got them on the choppers and flew them out. And we were loading up our ambulance to get them out. I had said, uh, when we're going to do simulation, I want to ride on that chopper. And the, you know, the pod on the side of the choppers the, early on, I said, I want to ride in that on the last load that we take. I didn't get to ride in one. We were taking real life, real life guys that really need a chopper ride. So, the, uh, when we got back from maneuvers to Fort Rucker, uh, we walked in battalion headquarters, the sergeant major said, here are your orders to Korea, lieutenant, sergeant, here are your orders. And the draftees and the reserve officers uh, were getting shipped out. So. Uh, home on leave, I went to uh, uh, arrive in June 25th uh, in uh, California and rode a ship to, to Korea, uh, 16 days. Uh, still a side story. <laughs> Yokohama, 16 days. We, anything that looked like a dress uniform, we checked in. We didn't need them. We got our, our real gear and got on the ship again and went around the tip of South Korea and headed up for Incheon to dock. And as we went around the, the uh, tip of uh, South Korea, going through the tail end of a typhoon. Well, about, I don't know, 75 brand new ensigns had joined us. They flew over and they joined us in, and they were on the ship. The ship was doing this, doing this. And uh, those of us who weren't say, looked at the crew and if they weren't panicked, why, okay. We heard a lot of China breaking in the dining room, and we were standing there, and there were a bunch of, a whole bunch of ensigns virtually leaning over the rail when it was safe. Three of us, I, I was one of the lucky ones, I was not motion. We started to sing Anchors Array away, and then we thought that was a little too. These guys were too weak to fight. They couldn't have started to fight, but we, we, we backed off the Anchors Away. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I, I've talked about divisions. So uh, the division at that time, I'm sure they're different now. About 15,000 men, triads, three regiments. The regiments had three battalions within them. And uh, the backup 
we had the medical battalion, which, which I was in, and a quartermaster taking care of supply, food, ordnance taking care of the ammunition, so forth, and artillery attached, part of the 15,000 men. And our medical battalion, one per division, uh, included uh, ambulance company, which had 92 guys, a clearing company, which uh, uh, had, had some MDs, some surgical techs in it. I'll, I'll share that in a minute. Okay. The b battalion aid station was right up getting the guys when they, as quickly as they could get them off the, off the uh, front, out where they were wounded, back to the battalion aid stations. There, were, there was an MD there and or surgical techs, and they would triage and say, okay, uh, if, if a guy could go back to duty in a couple of, couple of days, they would move him down to the regimental collecting station and uh, he'd just take it easy and recoup for a couple of days, then join his unit back in front. If they needed a little longer, uh, maybe as many as uh, oh, four or five days, they would go to the clearing station. There were some MDs and techs there and, uh, and they would stay there. And our headquarters was right near the clearing station. The ambulance company had, uh, uh, let's say, 92 men, 30 ambulances. And they su we supported those 15,000 uh, troops in battle. And those who needed help, there was a chopper strip, if possible, just down the road behind the highest hill from the battalion aid station. If the doc said, get these guys down to save a life or a limb, they, the choppers would fly them into the mash. And that, in a very busy time, a lot of injuries going on, that, uh, that was the key, to save a life or a limb. They were evacuated to that, that point. At night, of course, the choppers couldn't fly, so we had some serious, very badly wounded guys, and uh, my drivers were up there. Uh, they would put a couple of guys that really don't need to go machinery, and they would have to drive back blackout for several miles. And these guys were little cat eyes, they called them on the, and they were driving terrible roads, sometimes raining and muddy and sloppy roads. And not one of those guys uh, had a serious accident driving blackout until they got pretty well back away from the front. And they, uh, they would get those guys into the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. Now, uh, if the people were not going to be able to go back to service to service very very soon, we get them. Ambulances would take them down to the evac hospital down near Seoul, a place called Yongdongpo. There was an evacuation hospital there, and from there they would either be uh, sent to the big hospital in, in Tokyo or evacuated to the states. So. I, I arrived, uh, when I arrived there in, in Korea, uh, I got a ride up to my outfit. I was a platoon leader, which means I had uh, platoon sergeant, assistant platoon sergeant, 10 ambulances, 10 drivers, 10 assistant drivers, and that was my job when I first got there. So I got a ride up to my outfit, and there we uh, by the Imjin River, and they said, Lieutenant, your people will cross the river, and the river's at flood stage, there are no bridges. I don't swim. <laughs> so, uh, finally the, the uh, engineers got, got uh, and I, I joined my guys, and just for a very short time, we were online, and there was not, not a lot of action, but I was just learning the territory and uh, who these guys were and how, how we were gonna work together. And uh, we got pulled into reserve. Uh, you, your, div your division was online for a couple of months usually, uh, and then rotate, and another division would move up and you'd back, be back in reserve, getting uh, the new guys oriented and uh, running some uh, activities back behind uh, <coughs> to uh, that simulated what you might run into in the uh, uh, in real life when you're back online. Because a lot of the guys were new. Some guys rotated home every month, and, and uh, the new guys uh, replacing them needed that. Uh, so we went to this meeting, 
where a bunch of officers were talking about, now here's what we're going to do, guys. Here's the way we're going to run these activities. And I was sitting there, and, and uh, there was some guy named John Eisenhower there, Major John Eisenhower. And uh, okay, I, I, know, I know who he is. And this, this was, must have been in July, because we had a meeting about two weeks later, and John Eisenhower wasn't there. His dad had been nominated to run for president of the United States. And they went John Eisenhower out of Korea and, and out of Angel's Way. He was back home very quickly. So that's the only time I saw John. He was there. And, and uh, yes? Did your ambulances run two man crews? Yes, driver and assistant driver. Uh, and then uh, it was, I think, in February, as uh, I arrived in July, and in February, um, the company commander of the Ems Company rotated the states, and I took over the company, and I had uh, the 30 ambulances and uh, the 92 men. Uh, up until that, probably about February of 1953, been driving World War II vehicles <clears throat> up and down the roads. This is when they were running all the way up to the Alu and, uh, and back and forth, terrible roads. And uh, we had uh, mechanics just had, had their work cut out for them, uh, just keeping those uh, ambulances and trucks uh, mobile so, we could move, so, so they could move around. This was before I got there. Things were pretty well settled down when I arrived. Uh, Is there a better, my, better map, Mike? What are you trying to explain? What do you want to explain? Because uh, this is the okay. map. Okay. Yes. Now, in the after, after uh, the uh, Chinese entered the war, some people say you know three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand for uh, at uh, Yal Yalu, and uh, they pushed. American troops all the way back down, and they came across again, across the 38th parallel, and uh, uh, the area around Seoul, that whole middle area, had been fought over once when they came through, back, and now again, the third time, they're, they're fighting over that area around the 38th parallel and south around Seoul. Devastation, devastation. And finally, uh, General Ridgeway uh, pushed back, and on the north side of the 38th parallel. Yeah, go go ahead, get the next one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The okay, uh, the MLR ran along where that says July 1st, Kumwa, Chorwan. That that is pretty much where the uh, where the uh, main line of resistance. We were here behind a whole row of hills, a mile and a half across the valley. The Chinese had their MLR and dug in uh, uh, that uh, would be a terrible, terrible loss of life in which there had were a few times. But they would, uh, we would fight, the troops would fight, uh, go on patrols out between the two MLRs and uh, and uh, sometimes they would run into uh, patrol from the other side, and sometimes they wouldn't. But uh, we always had a couple of ambulances on, if I could be. Okay. This? Yeah, okay. That was about five miles back. That was where we headquarters. That was our, our motor pool, and those were our tents. We had to spread all our tents out just in case there was an air raid. There never was, but we still had our tents for the 92 guys spread out, and we spread out the ambulances at night. But their guys were probably working on them that day. And, uh, and boredom was a, a really, it was hard to overcome because many days there was nothing to do. Uh, so they'd work on their vehicles. Uh, we rotated, uh, can you come on? Okay. We we would rot we would rotate. Um, well, that's the Chinese were over behind that hill, mile and a half over here, and they would patrol at night, usually at night, the daytime, and run at each other and have wounded. 
uh, we always had a couple of ambulances at, at the battalion aid station, and uh, they would, uh, in the middle of the night, they would get some wood and have to take them, however, uh, wherever they were, uh, the, into some of the, uh, the clearing company or maybe way on back to MASH if they needed that kind of help. Um, the, uh, okay. Uh, that is one of our battalion aid stations, and it's sandbag and uh, big, look like ra railroad ties supported with sandbags on top of that. That's my driver and me uh, checking out how things are going up there. And uh, one of our other battalion aid stations was strictly a big cave in the reverse slope of a hill. And the guys lived in there, they treated patients in there, and, uh, but the, uh, we would, we had revetments like this for the for the ambulance to park. So if there if something dropped in, uh, somebody started shelling, uh, at least the uh, the engine would not be hurt. And uh, so in the middle of the night, if they're wounded coming back, get called in, they'd get this ambulance ready and load it up and uh, head back down the road. Uh, here, uh, so. That that's a mash uh, crew, and the M, some of the the MDs and the the uh, surgical techs. It's my recollection that there were 13 nurses on the staff at at mash. Um, I I did not know any of them. I saw a few of them, and I've never seen such an old-looking bunch of young women in my life. And uh, when you see MASH and you see those guys doing crazy things uh, to and with each other, uh, and I saw these young ladies up close and personal, uh, they stood there very often day after day working on guys, young guys, 18, 19, 20 years old. Uh, and we knew nobody was going to win at that time, win that police action because they were too well dug in on the North Hills, we were too well dug in, and nobody was going to. And so these young guys were getting, we were hauling these young guys down to the mash or uh, whatever, and uh, it got to them, I think. Not necessarily the hours and the work they did, but just seeing that day after day when in a busy, busy time. Okay. Okay. That's, that's my driver, a guy named Smokey Mosier. Um, he and I smoked cigars. And we had a PX uh, about every three weeks. We had a little Quonset hut, and uh, the truck would bring candy, chips, uh, soda pop, beer, and cigars. So as soon as it came in, Smokey and I would, would run over and see how many boxes of cigars. If there were quite a few, he and I would get one each. If, uh, if there weren't many, why, we'd split one. And we'd drive around, You're not supposed to smoke driving down the road, but you could chew them, and then as soon as you weren't driving anymore, you light them up. Uh, and in the wintertime uh, in Korea, you weren't, a, back, back a bit, just, when you got within about a couple miles of the front, that windshield had to come down. There were no side curtains on it, so you needed to be able to get out in a hurry just in case. Uh, so we were riding around in the cold winter, uh, checking those ambulances and uh, freezing to death every time you walk into a tent or one of those bunkers. Somebody say, have a cup of coffee, have a cup of coffee. Oh, uh, I'll tell you how much coffee I drink sometime. But there, there was a sign back there that said, from this point forward, Chinese, Chinese direct traffic. And uh, so, yeah, the Reds direct traffic. So we stopped there, took a picture, and then took off driving like the devil. So just, <laughs> they, saw, they, they weren't throwing any shells in down that valley at that time. Uh, there I am in winter gear, and it, it was good. Okay. We, lived in, okay. we lived in tents, uh, four officers in this tent, and we had a diesel stove, uh, big, big diesel, can of diesel, uh, barrel of diesel outside, feeding the stove at night. We needed to turn them off because there were an awful lot of fires. Uh, people didn't clean 
the flus and so forth. A lot of injuries from people burned. So we would turn them off at night. We would put our five gallon water can right next to this hot stove. And uh, our uh, Korean helper came, would come in at six o'clock in the morning and he would pick up that can. If he heard ice in there, he would exercise his English vocabulary. He knew nothing but cuss words. He just let her rip. <laughs> he knew all the cuss words. And we're lying there in these big sleeping bags. <laughs> there goes Kim again. Yeah. A good, good guy. They, pay, they paid the, uh, the Koreans who were there working a dollar a day. And it didn't cost, so they, they were sending money, money home. And, uh, but uh, we had with us uh, three rock soldiers and about five uh, Korean uh, civilians that were cleared to work with us for a buck a day. The rock soldiers didn't get nearly that much. Okay, there's a picture of the MASH, the 44th MASH. That's where earlier in the conflict, the guy who wrote the book was at the 44th MASH. Uh, that is one of my platoon leaders um, coming out of the MASH, all stove up. I don't know what he told his family back home, but he broke it playing volleyball. <laughs> but it's still a good story. Uh, that picture, can you imagine? Hey, yeah, you bet I was in combat. Okay. No, uh, Dave probably didn't do that, but uh, he, he could have. Okay, the, uh, that's, I'm the old man, I'm 25. The guy on my uh, right there, it was uh, aid man, uh, or corpsman that hit uh, the beach in Saipan with the uh, Marines. And uh, the fellow over here is probably about 30 years old, a staff sergeant, he, he uh, enlisted probably 1939, 40, couldn't find any jobs, so he enlisted in the Army, had been there ever since. Good NCOs. Now, the fellow was my first sergeant on the right there, was a big talker, a good soldier, but a big talker. So, he was talking about hitting the, the beach in Saipan. After 44 guys, two hours later, there were six of them still on their feet. And uh, he was one. I thought, well, I'm gonna check. So I went over and checked his two old five. Three purple hearts and a silver star. Okay, 18, 19 year old corpsman. So he, he waived a disability uh, to come back into service. Light a cigarette in the morning if he was lucky. Uh, so it was a, that, from that uh, experience. Okay. So just one other quick story, okay? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that's in the one week in April, uh, for whatever reason, we and the Chinese decided to fight over a little place out there in the valley. We had a thousand casualties just in that area. Um, the choppers were flying all, night, all day long, as fast as they could, and I had ambulances running shuttles. We'd have two or three outside the A station, loading, getting going. And, these new vehicles we'd had about three months, six of them got holes in them. The drivers, after, after it was all over, the drivers were devastated. My hands. I called ordinance, said, what can we do? Can we get them repaired? Repaired to send over the paperwork. They went down to Seoul and with the drivers and they came back with brand new vehicles. Said, Lieutenant, there are, there's a couple of acres of ambulances, two or three acres of two and a half ton trucks and acres and acres of little Jeeps, brand new that got there two and a half years after we'd been running up, they had been running up down the peninsula uh, in the World War II stuff. But, uh, okay, the, uh, this fellow probably will go, to, uh, to, uh, he's mobile, he'd probably go down to maybe the touring company where he may stay uh, for three or four days if he's able to go back if that head wound is serious enough, he won't go back. He'll be on, perhaps onto the back hospital, okay? This, this fellow is not mobile at all and he needs somebody to, to get him on, uh, I'm sorry, on uh, probably some Korean uh, civilians who did some of the heavy lifting. They'd go out and pick up wounded guys where they were being treated right and bring them back to the battalion aid station. Uh, I don't know what they're paying those guys, but uh, so here are some people getting, uh, obviously a very, very wounded coming in very quickly here. 
I got these off, off the wire. These are not personal experiences, but this is what was kind of thing that was happening. Uh, and uh, the guy's wounded. And, and uh, here, uh, this, this is a Marine chopper. They're loading up wounded guys, probably to take them back to the mash. Okay. Uh, again, that picture, uh, I don't, I suspect that guy's not wounded, but he is shocked. He's, he's lost somebody, something's happened. He's, he's talking about a first, a close and personal. The, uh, okay. this, this is the inside picture of a mash. Surgeon with some surgical texts and, and other guys so figuring out what's going on. But again, this is to save a life or a limb, and that's, that's one of the, the MD is working in the, uh, in the, uh, the mash. Mash was far enough back that they didn't have to worry, and this probably was later, to, uh, they did not have to worry about spreading the tents out. So that, that is a mash unit. And uh, patients in some, uh, staff, uh, docs, nurses, medical techs, and uh, I don't see a chopper strip, but there, there is one in the, in the area. And uh, here's, here's a Korean soldier that uh, obviously has been wounded, but he's going to have some, some chow anyway. Okay. Mike, it's going too long? No. Okay. Okay, let me, uh, we did not know the ceasefire was coming, we were hoping of course, but in uh, 13th of July, the ceasefire happened 20, 27th, so two weeks before the ceasefire, uh, okay, let's go to the next one, okay, uh, we were moving off the line, and the second division, 15,000 guys were taking our place. And we'd arranged it, started after dark, we started moving back, and we moved back in a reserve area, 30,000 troops on the roof, roughly moving, exchanging places. Over east of, what, about 15, 20 miles east, there was a bulge in the Kumsan River. And 80,000 Chinese decided they were gonna straighten that out before the ceasefire. And 80,000 Chinese came over a, a, a Korean uh, division and the 555th Regimental Combat Team and just spread out behind the lines. And uh, we, were, we were sitting back there, uh, wounded guys all over the place, we knew that. We were saying, where do we go? And we sat there for all day long in our ambulances waiting for a call to go up and help get rid of some of those guys or get, get them uh, attention. So uh, about, after, about dark on the 14th, he said, okay, here's where you go. We'd never been there before. We were driving blackout, rainy night, muddy roads, uh, convoys of, ambul of uh, ammunition going up and tank columns going up. We'd pull over and they'd go and buy us. Finally, we found out where our headquarters was. We went in, I walked in to uh, and here's the colonel on the phone. I, he was saying, where is company A? Well, where is B? He was, the answers he was getting, we don't know, sir. We don't know where our people are that we've brought in reserve and they're up there someplace. Uh, so we sat, sat there, finally I got instructions where to take my ambulances and start picking up the wounded guys who'd been uh, ready for evacuation. You could go to the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. As we were moving up there, uh, we, ha we heard no artillery, and suddenly there, there were several batteries of artillery about, I don't know, a couple hundred yards. There. They were firing over our head, and suddenly they started to fire, and we didn't even know they were there. And talk about a shock. Uh, well, finally, we found out where to take our ambulances and uh, load it up with four or five guys per ambulance. We had 30 of them, we had, so we had 100 and 20 wounded, and they said, you guys can't go back down that road you just came up because we don't know who's in charge of that road. So we sat there all night, and these, these fellows uh, wounded, in pain. Uh, the medics, uh, uh, the aid men were running down, giving morphine about up and down the whole line of ambulances. So shortly after daylight, 
we got some uh, support vehicles. We got some arm, armored vehicles that said, okay, let's go. We'll take you back down the road. On that road going down, there were three two and a half ton trucks shot to pieces with the, the driver out lying beside them. Uh, so it's well they did not let us go down that road because obviously there were Chinese snipers along there taking care of traffic. But we made it out okay and got these guys back to the, uh, to where they, uh, but that was my longest night. Uh, sitting there for about four or five hours, these guys in terrible pain, some of them, shot with morphine, couldn't do a thing, couldn't do a thing. They all looked like my kid brother, five years younger. Uh, that was the hardest part for me, uh, not being able to do what we, okay. Uh, when I came home, I was waiting to come home the, the day they quit shooting, two weeks after that, uh, little longest night, and uh, there's my driver, Smokey Mosher, there's the first sergeant there, and Sergeant Bill Bryant. Uh, my first sergeant came, came with me, uh, rotated home, and uh, we needed an experienced sergeant to take over as the chief, the main non-com, and Bill Bryant was, uh, had about seven or eight years experience. Uh, there were, of the 92 guys, there were always 10 or 11 Afro-Americans in, in our unit. If two guys went home, we'd get two more African-Americans. So we, we were integrated, 10% of the population, 10% of our company. And uh, Bill Bryant was a certified uh, uh, mortician's assistant in Indiana. Uh, he had had uh, several years, and he, he did a heck of a job uh, when he came over. Uh, he'd been in trouble a couple of times trying to get his uh, Japanese daughter from his, and uh, created a problem, so they, uh, we found out he was a, even though he had created trouble in, uh, in uh, trying to get his daughter back, they, they shipped him to Korea twice, but he was a heck of a soldier, and uh, I always wondered how that came up, because you know there were probably, what, 20, 25 guys from the South who, uh, 1953, uh, but I, I, don't, I, I don't know of any difficulty. I always wondered if Bill, because uh, he was thrown into a really tough, uh, tough situation. Okay, R&R, um, &R. recreation. Some other people had names for it. So I went, I went first in November, I got there, and uh, flew to Tokyo, and uh, we were sitting in a bar. We were sitting in a bar talking with the bartender. And uh, so I had just been elected, and uh, we took this uh, Japanese bartender, said, Ike number one, Ike number one, uh, he says, uh, uh, MacArthur number one, Ike number two. Uh, was so much good happened when Ma MacArthur was as far as getting uh, everything going again uh, uh, that uh, MacArthur was number one, even though Ike was president and uh, Ike was number two. Uh, this was the second time I got in April, R&R. Uh, &R, we got there to Kempo Airport. We're going to fly to, to Tokyo and have five days of really good fun. And one of the guys came out. He said, you guys are going to be held up about four or five hours. He said, those two planes out there have other priorities. And as we sat there, a whole column of ambulances pulled up. And these were guys, some of them had been in prison camp since 1950. Ter terribly... Uh, poorly taken care of. Uh, they were, the wounds that they received maybe two and a half years before had not healed. They were emaciated. Some of them had, uh, uh, had quite a bit of uh, uh, brainwashing the hard way. And uh, I didn't hear anybody complain that we had to wait for a couple hours to, well, well they loaded about uh, almost 400 guys on those planes and got them to heck Tokyo where they could get help. Uh, Okay, remember the area around Seoul that, that had been fought over once when the Chinese uh, Ch came down, once when they went back again in 19, uh, early 51, and then again, so four times that whole area around the middle of uh, Korea. Uh, 
Seoul, devastated, nothing. The people had nothing. That's what it looked like. 2014, that's what it looked like. Unbelievable. There's a fellow here sitting back there who's been there a couple of times, and uh, he brought me a book uh, signed by the uh, South Korean president, uh, and that's where I got that picture. That's what it looks like now. Unbelievable. I can't. Lou's been there and had seen it, but I, I can't imagine how they've come so far in such a, a short, short time. Well, such, with our help. Okay. Could you maybe open it for questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I got a lot. I threw in a lot of history and stuff that was not necessarily the medical support, but uh, there's a lot more. If you <laughs> <laughs> Larry. Or, yeah. Did the Chinese or the North Koreans, did they observe any of the, the rules of war not firing at the embassies and so on and so forth? Uh, not, not usually. They had these new ambulances I was talking about. But when this driver, driving this beautiful new ambulance after driving our old wreck for six months, when they went up on the roads where the Chinese, that they had have to mud out the top and try to mud out the size of the Red Cross because occasionally they would use for target practice. Not often, not often, but it, it, earlier in the war, yes, it had, it had happened. Uh, so they so, cheated, they uh, cheated huh? <laughs> Yeah, well, of course, what, what they did to the prisoners and the, the uh, brainwashing uh, with, with serious physical, was the, uh, Questions? Yes? Modern ambulances are very well stocked with various supplies to take care of the, the wounded. I imagine that in that day your main mission was just transport. What, what did you have on board to, to take care of the, the, the so uh, we, we had blankets and, uh, and uh, stretchers, litters. Uh, that, that week that we had a thousand casualties, uh, I didn't get any of the kids shot. I got six ambulances, but this one kid almost three times. The closest one, he was loading a wounded soldier into his ambulance right here, and the guy's boot was right here. And a round fell on and wounded that guy in the boot right next to the, my driver's hand. And two other close ones with the same kid. But he, he made it. He, did, he didn't. But no, we we had we had blankets and litters that fit in the ambulance. That was it. Uh, some of the ambulance drivers uh, had been trained as uh, medics, very short course. But most of them not. They 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 were drivers. They learned something if they wanted to when they were up there on standby uh, uh, with the, with the medics with the. Yeah. But a very difficult time keeping uh, people not being bored because nothing was happening. Uh, sometimes we, we hauled a lot more ambulance or uh, uh, fire victims because they weren't taking care of their, their tent and their, or uh, accidents. Uh, the roads were terrible. The, the engineers did a heck of a job trying to keep them passable. But in the rainy season, the shoulders would give way. Two and a half ton truck full of, of, PO, of POL or ammunition would roll over and roll over some of the drivers and so forth. And very often we'd haul more accident victims in a week than we would wounded uh, because there just wasn't that much happening out between the two MLRs. Probably watched every episode of MASH on TV and the book and everything, but as you're watching, what are your thought processes about what's real and what's not real? Uh, well, I would say that some of the, it would be understandable if they always had something going like that because of what they were seeing as soon as they had to go down to the sur surgery room. They saw these young kids coming in and they were operating on them. But when they were not busy, just to keep maybe focusing on what they were seeing and working with every day, 
it would be understandable that you have some clowns like those guys portrayed doing something just to keep from losing it with all these, again, particularly the last, well, year or so of the war. Nobody was going to win. It would have been a, a massacre for either side to really try to, try to move very far up, up or down the peninsula. So we knew but nobody was going to win and we were still getting young kids shot every day. That was, that was the hardest part for, I think, those people to take. So it would not surprise me if they had a couple of clowns like that, that they would say, no, we, we got to... I never did meet Hot Lips Hule. And <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, who was your favorite character? <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Well, why don't we just quickly go through the last couple slides we got, because they're quite interesting, too. Okay. Just oh. let's move. Okay. Move. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Uh, if I had known that I was going to teach world geography in uh, junior high when I got back, I'd have taken a more, lot more pictures of civilians. Uh, okay, there's, he was my driver for a while. That's the first sergeant in the sweatshirt back there. Uh, there was, that's our mess sergeant, not the next guy. He was, he was our mess sergeant. And uh, there are three Korean soldiers and as I say, about four civilians that work for us. Uh, Kim Jong-suk, he was my driver for a while. He could speak English fairly well. Uh, he wanted to come to the States and study engineering. And the guys who knew a little bit of electricity on our motor said, this guy just has a natural feel for it. He would be great. But I'm pretty sure he did not make it to the States. He, the Papa son, he was our tailor. And uh, I think Papa San must have been a teacher or a, at night where often these Korean guys would wind up down there mainly listening to Papa San, but visiting with Papa San. Uh, he had the respect and he had something that, that these young guys needed. And uh, that, that's a picture of my, my driver again, Kim jong So This was uh, this were a houseboy that uh, uh, no, <laughs> no, no, every cuss word in English, not, not much else. So he, w he went on leave for a week, and our first sergeant, I think, was curious about, so he said, I'll give you a ride down there to his village. So he said they moved, drove into the village, and he let Kim sit in the front seat next to the driver, and the first sergeant sat in back, and people came out, ooh, ooh, Kim. And he, he was waving, like, you know. <laughs> And so the people obviously knew Kim and liked Kim, but that, that was Kim and his wife and uh, daughter. Uh, the water buffalo were all gone, no transportation. Any transportation, uh, the, the Korean army had the trucks. So transportation was like this, or a guy with a big pack on his back, 110 pound guy carrying 160 pounds down the road for a while, and then he'd give it, somebody else would take it on for the next uh, laundry day. Okay. There were little stands along the road, anything that they could get their hands on to sell something to make a few bucks because they had absolutely nothing. The people had been there and fought, had seen their homes fought over, and, and luckily, uh, Mama San doing laundry in a very dirty stream. It's amazing how, how clean uh, she got their clothes. Okay, uh, we were told when, when these guys go home on leave, the Koreans, they may bring back some. Uh, something for you to eat, some fresh produce. Don't eat it, okay? The community well, people down getting water at the community well, rice paddy, a little lower, and you know how the rice paddies are fertilized. Don't eat anything. So, uh, we did not. Okay, uh, Korean money, they, the Koreans were paid in this, uh, so let's say 6,000 won equal one dollar. Okay, next one. The GIs were paid in the script. We weren't given any greenbacks. Uh, now, we were not supposed to give any of that to, uh, to our Koreans, but like Kim, 
our houseboy, some of the others would do things special for us, and we managed to get, uh, get them a few uh, of our pay. Um, I was getting, what, $125 a month as a, new, as a second lieutenant when I went over there. And, uh, but most of us said, well, give me 25 bucks a month, and the rest was going to the bank account or sent home to my dad to put in the bank. Uh, oh. Okay. <laughs> U U.S. O shows. Uh, now, this was later, remember, when things had settled down. They weren't running up and down the peninsula. This, uh, so we got to send about six or seven of our guys, and every unit had a small quota. And these guys came back and said, we had lunch with them. And I sat across the table from this gal. Her name was June Christie. Well, I've got all June Christie's records now. She's one of my favorites uh, of that era. It's June, June Christie. And uh, Herb Jeffries were the two vocalists with that, with that group. So... Uh, Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> so I've got it. <laughs> One thing I forgot to do, and I apologize in the beginning, is I'd like to recognize those of you who served in Korea. If you could just raise your hands here. And so, one gentleman here with who, sir? Who went to Korea. Okay. During the time, but I was going to ask. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And Lou Barrientos, if you've not met him before in the back, Lou was with the second division. So probably experienced that same battle which uh, uh, Marv was talking about. And, but Lou also was with the division when it fought its way out from the Chosin Reservoir. And then eventually the push back up north in the Battle of Heartbreak Ridge and the Punch Bowl area. Yeah. Uh, we have one of our exhibits up in our uh, Korean War Room uh, depicts Lou's experience. So I hope you'll stick around for that. Okay. Yeah. And, and please visit with you know, everybody here. Uh, I, I'd just like to mention, yeah. the, uh, I did forget to mention that longest night, uh, the, the uh, helicopters that were bigger than the little one had, had just arrived a few months before, and one of our neighbors uh, in Broomfield said, oh yeah, I was flying ammunition up and wounded guys back that, that night when I was waiting to haul the, uh, uh, haul the wounded out of there. He was in that. And I talked about, uh, with some other guy, another guy from Gate and Green, where we used to live, uh, about that artillery going off over our heads. He said, yeah, I was there. So uh, two small world stories. Two, two of my neighbors in, uh, in, uh, were there that night, one shooting artillery over our head and the other one flying to chopper. Uh, getting the wounded and the ammunition. And that might have been Bob Greeno. Yes. Uh, sadly but, died but, a couple years ago, but Bob was in the first units that deployed helicopters and developed all that kind of uh, way of evacuating soldiers, resupplying, and everything which formed the basis for our you know, air aviation assets during Vietnam, for those of us who followed. Uh, but anyway, Lou, I no, no, that's Lou. Marv, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much well, for being well, our speaker today. And you. just want to give you one of our challenge uh, coins thank you. for well, that. So please, and, and I'd like to thank Kathy, because yeah. Karen, Karen, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy. My, my mind's thinking of my different <laughs> things. Yeah, I'm getting, that's true. But anyway, thank you so much for helping to put together the slideshow for Marv and keeping him moving with there too. So thank you very much everyone. Please stick around, visit some more, uh, and have some more refreshments and join us upstairs. <laughs>